Good evening. I think it's 7 o'clock, so it's time to begin. So thank you all for coming tonight. I'm really pleased that we have so many people here to hear from our candidates for the Lompoc Unified School District. Let's begin. One minute opening statement, and we're going to start with Mr. Galena. And I would like to ask all of the candidates to please stand while you're talking, because it's very difficult for the people in the back to see you, and everybody wants to see you. So, and they will pass the mic. It's very important that you all use the mic too, also because of the film of the uh, Tap TV. Okay, we're ready, Mr. Galena. Good evening. I'm Hank Galena, Henry Galena, and um, I'm. Uh, but presently a member of the uh, Lompoc Unified School District, uh, the president and I'm incumbent. And um, a little bit about my background, a long time community member. I've been a community member here in Lompoc for about 50 years. And I've been a school administrator at Los Barros Elementary School. I opened Miguelito School, was principal at El Camino and Clarence Ruth, and also co coordinator of special projects. I have a father of two grown children who graduated from the Lompoc High School and a four-year member of the Lompoc Unified School District. Two years I've been on the, uh, I've been the vice president. I am teaching leadership skills and people skills at Allen Hancock. And in April, I was awarded a 20-year service recognition pin. I'm extremely willing to continue to work with the community and fellow board members to support all forms of quality education. The last one on here, as my dear wife said, you need to mention that you're a proud owner of a cute Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. <laughs> uh, I, think, um, I, have a, I have a degree. Okay, thank you. Okay. And number two, Jack. Let I me mean, know if I get too loud back there. I got an old voice here. Good evening. My name is Jeff Karlowski. First thing I'd like to do is thank the American Association and University of Women for sponsoring this forum for the Lompoc community. My wife and I have called Lompoc home since 1999 when I was hired as a principal at Cabrillo High School. Before that, I served, I brought with me 23 years as a teacher, coach, athletic director, and work experience coordinator from the high school level. And for the next 20 years, I served as a high school principal for 11 years five years as a junior high principal, and six years as an elementary school principal. While at Cabrillo High School, I also got involved in Lomp Leadership Lompoc Valley, sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce here in Lompoc. And I was also on the board of directors for the Chamber of Commerce. I'm a proud parent of a three public school educated sons, have nine grandchildren and two great grandchildren. I'm running for the school board because at, my, at the core, I'm an educator and a team player. I'd like to be part of a team that positively impacts student achievement. And I'm, I would like to give back to the Lompoc community, and it's, good, it's been an awful good community to me. Thank you. Okay, Dick. Nice to see everybody here this evening. My name is uh, Richard Barrett. Most of you know me as Dick. I've been around here 30 years. Um, started education in 1970. I've been a school vice principal. I've been an athletic director, a privilege to teach in the classroom and also a coach. Um, and I'm really excited to be here tonight because I was asked to do this and I ran for a couple of reasons. First of all, we have a great school district with great teachers and staff. And I think that needs to be brought out more than we see in the paper except just the issues with the school boards and the hostile work environment and all that kind of stuff. And I think it's time to get back to why we're here and that's to take a real positive approach and I'll bring that energy to support the children in our school district. That's what it's supposed to be about. But you don't read much about that anymore. And uh, hopefully I can help bring that to the table as well as supporting the staff and the principals. And we'll talk about that later on. And there's some just great things going on in our school district. Thank you. Okay, Richard. My name is Richard King. Reform is needed. I would like to opportunity to offer that change. I have been a resident of Lompoc for the last 23 years. I am married, have a wife and one son. He's currently uh, at LVMS. I'm not a politician. 
I'm running for the school board member due to some concerns I have about the school board and the school district. My goals will be raise the school standards, challenge the current school policies in grade K through 12. A good example of this is the current grade promotion policy in elementary schools. Bring back the reading, writing, arts, and history, and science, back to the elementary school. In other words, get back to basics. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very much. And now we're ready for question number one. And we will begin with Mr. Galena for number one, and then I'll keep, I'll go down the row, and everybody, everybody gets a chance to be first, okay? Okay, so the first question. As you know, the American Association of University Women strongly supports the vigorous enforcement of Title IX and all other civil rights laws pertaining to education. What are the major components of Title IX and how do you propose to enforce them? Mr. Galindo. Title IX is the equal opportunities um, law that was passed a number of years ago. And as I checked with the uh, district here, uh, within our district itself, we do not seem to have uh, any problems with Title IX because uh, we've been very close to the law, and uh, especially in, uh, in sports and also in terms of uh, club activities, ASB, uh, the com complete balance. Um, and also in the, in the elective classes, the classes are balanced as, as well uh, that we have. And um, I think that uh, in the working with the, and continue to work with those situations. There's also, I need to, like to report a, um, and something that the district and the school board will have to, will, is already on it. And it has to deal with, um, a latest law that was signed by the governor of California, uh, Senate Bill 1375. And it says all public schools, private schools that receive federal funds and are subject to the requirements of Title IX, school districts, county offices of education, charter schools to post a, in a predominant and conspicuous location on their internet website specific information regarding Title IX. So that's one of the major things that our district will be doing, and I think it's already been done uh, to, uh, to work with that. Um, I'm a strong proponent of uh, the Title IX in terms of uh, balance in, uh, in, in education and thing. Uh, I have a daughter who is a civil engineer, and she keeps me straight as to having balance and uh, within the uh, uh, within the community and within the schools and, and so forth that deals with that. So uh, we need to just continue to work with that thing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Jeff. Title IX means equal access and equal facilities for both female and male students. I was a coach uh, back in 1972 when the law came on effect and it first started out it was pretty Pretty sorry, to be honest with you. I didn't think we did a good job. And our district down in Escondido kind of got their hands slapped a little bit because we, we offered programs that we didn't offer the coaching that went with it. So I was one of the starters. I started coaching girls softball in 1975 at Orange Glen High School down in Escondido. And then we had the facility problem. We had a uh, equal facility has got to be for boys and girls. You put concrete dugouts in one, you got to put concrete dugouts in the other. We put brick dugouts in Cabrillo High School in 19, or 2002. We followed up, also put them in the girls' softball field. Equal access equals equal facilities. Also, girls at that time were uh, oftentimes uh, not permitted to take higher level classes, and so equal access to all classes. And so it basically, it's really done a good job, and I think now you'll find most of your girls are, remember my last stint as a principal, I think I had 15 kids in a 4.0, 14 of them were girls, so something's, I told the guys they got to kick it up a notch, but anyway, it's not working, so that's basically Title IX. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dick? 
Made me stand, I can't see my notes, no fear. <laughs> uh, you already heard what total, Title IX is, and I, I'll remember when I was at Cal Poly in the late 60s when it first came out, and it was a, a big revolutionary type thing, and some of the colleges were losing men's programs because they had to give equal amount to women's programs, and it wasn't until I got into uh, teaching and coaching and administration on the high school level in the 1970s that I really saw the benefit and, and what was going on. It's pretty exciting right now to see, particularly in our school district. But I would expect, when we're talking about Title IX, the superintendent to enforce and be accountable for the pattern of hiring for both certified and classified. I mean, we're on the school board, but I mean, he's the guy that's got to make that happen. And that would, that would include classified and certified. The district should create opportunities for all, examples, not just the athletic equality, but others also. Uh, and you know, when you, if you take a look at the, uh, the LPAC stuff that talks about being able to hold everybody accountable, we're also talking English learners and interventions and following the California state standard alignments. And those are the things that will help keep Title IX in the forefront. Other things, in our school district, 11 of the 16 principals are women. And that's, that's a real statement right there as far as what our district is trying to do for equality. Also in the district office, the people that kind of run the show there on the district side, the head of business services, educational services, ITS department, special education, and human resources are women. So I really think that um, we've done a pretty good job, but like I said, we, we've got to keep going on this thing to make it, to make it happen. And the various programs in the district, these, these more cutting edge programs like the STEAM Academy, La Honda, the dual immersion program at Hapgood, a number, and, and those kinds of things, and the visual and performing arts programs at Los Barrios, run by women. So our district is really women-led if you look at it that way. And uh, the basically the last thing I wanna say is we've gotta enforce Title IX, and the administration needs to provide us with statistics showing what's going on so we can support the programs. Great, thank you. Richard. I'm going to make this short and sweet. A living law. I'm going to do an overview, says everybody else has talked about the Title IX. No person in the United States shall, on basis of sex, be included, excluded from participating in be denied in benefits of or be subjected to discrimination under the education program or activities receive federal finance assistance. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And now I'll turn my screen back on. Let's see if that works. Okay. And the second question, and you'll be first, Jeff, for the second question. Would you discuss two of the areas that were highlighted by the grand jury report, and what would you propose to improve upon them? First of all, I'd like to know how many have read the grand jury report from the county. If you haven't, I, de I definitely suggest you do that, because it's pretty, pretty uh, revealing what's going on or what has been going on. And I think the district's done a good job to address those issues. I'm going to take two issues. I don't know if I can get it done in two minutes, but I'm going to try. One is uh, the uh, hostile work environment that's been created, that was supposedly created. As my experience as a minister, oftentimes the, when, a, when a staff member gets a no answer, they take that as being hostile. That's not always the case. But in this case, it was the case. Down at the district office, basically, this is where all this stuff happened. And basically, the way the grand jury gets involved is somebody writes a letter to them. And then they, if they think there's enough merit to the issue, then they, they'll send out an investigative team and they, they start investigating. Basically, we had a situation where somebody's respect was not adhered to. Uh, and there, some people got browbeat a little bit, got, got forced into situations that were uncomfortable. And uh, I'm not gonna mention any names because I don't think that's my place. But I really don't think that uh, I think it was just basically one or two little instances that got blown out of proportion. And I think the district's done a great job to address those issues by making sure that there is an avenue for those people to go to and, and get help if they do have a problem. Administrators, oftentimes, they get browbeat. 
<laughs> they get browbeat and uh, they don't uh, have an avenue to release that. So they have to sit there and take it. And also uh, for a uh, whistleblower, oftentimes there's a re restitution against those people. So make sure that those two things aren't happening. Next thing is school finances. The school finance situation that was happening at the district is we had some misappropriation of funds, I thought. We had some POs go through, for example, a purchase order uh, was, uh, it's, in the, it's in a report that was released. And this is the time the district was going through a change in, a, in the business department, so I think some things snuck through the back door. But I think what happened is uh, somebody changed, somebody tried to turn in a purchase order for uh, $7,000 for a motel room at a conference, and that's, that got kicked back by the, the, the county. So now they have, some, uh, they have some avenues in place now that are gonna definitely check all the POs, and make sure everything's dotted, all of these I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dick. Well, it was very revealing to read the grand jury report, and there are basically seven, seven issues there, and uh, I attended the 7.30 morning Thanks a lot for that, Steve. Uh, meeting of the board for one morning, and when they actually uh, the district was answering the the questions from the grand jury, and I felt the district um, legal staff did a great job in answering those questions, and the board basically supported just about all of them. Uh, the two I picked out because I didn't want to get involved with the the others. I mean, six or seven were about one specific issue. I picked out the one where the Lord, uh, it said the US, LUSD Board of Education does not have adequate control of expenditures of the general fund that are being allocated and tracked. And basically what we have to do, the board needs to obtain an independent specific audit of the general fund expenditures to clarify the use of public funds. I don't think that's a difficult thing to do. I think we can do that. And if that doesn't happen within our current board, if I'm elected, we will certainly attack that when I'm on the board. The second thing was a question that they had for the board saying that it does not adequately account for the um, presence of its, of its um, staff and management during work hours. And that was something that came out in the report. And obviously, we've got to enforce an attendance policy for staff and management to ensure they are present and accounted for during work hours. I don't think that's anything that's gonna be rocket science. I think the individual sites can take care of that and also within the school district. So those are the two that I picked and I think those are things that we can take care of. Okay, thank you. Okay, I picked out basically three and it's gonna be short. I would like the current school board abide by all grand jury findings, and also update all board policies regards to conflict of interest, travel allowances for staff and board members. Implement set safeguards for these policies. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Oh, Mr. Galena. <laughs> Yes. yes. <laughs> it's your turn. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the the question I, uh, I was a little. A little I, you need oh, the I'm mic. I'm sorry. Uh, I was a little confused about the question in number two because um, on August the nineteenth, um, we had a special board meeting in which the seven recommendations were addressed as to, as to what was going on. And uh, so, but anyways, I picked two of them. Uh, one of them has to do with the, um, uh, with the financing and school services. Uh, the district has employed uh, school services to do a complete uh, analysis as to the procedures and so forth dealing with financing. Uh, and they also have part of that uh, service will be a, an audit, uh, an internal audit of the special education program that was uh, uh, that came up when the grand jury. So that's been taken care of already. Uh, the other one had to do is, same thing that one of my colleagues said, about the hostility. Um, that hostility is directed to one uh, department of, of the district. And um, just recently we did a, a complete um, um, 
climate survey of the schools, which included administrators and thing. And um, basically, the, let me see this with my glasses here so I can see this. And a result of, a result of that, uh, for instance, field responsible to improve school, 86% was positive. Staff support and treat each other with respect, 79%. Promotes staff trust and collegial, 75%. And so it, there is in the district itself um, a great deal of collaboration, a great deal of respect, and a great deal of, of, of coming together, I think. And uh, it's too bad that just one department had the situation uh, in, in hand in that. So things are working out, and um, as I say, we're in good... We're in good condition as far as the staff was going. Okay, thank you very much. All right, question number three. And this, we will start with Dick. Thanks a lot, Diane. And, and I'll try not to Finances. forget the others, okay? Every, All right, here we go. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna read it to the audience. Every year, school budgets are tight. What would you do to ensure that more money is used for the classrooms instead of administrative positions and cost? Okay, take it away. Okay, excuse me, I you know, didn't bring my glasses tonight, okay. Um, there is a state formula. There's a state formula that, um, that, uh, that the district must follow uh, as far as the percentage of, of administration compared to teachers and those kinds of things and, and that's being followed and I'm not going to really address that as much because um, the stakeholders and the community members are getting an opportunity to have their say as far as financial matters and it comes through the California School Climate Survey which includes three surveys California Healthy Kids Survey, California School Parent Survey and then LCAP as we've alluded to before the local control and accountability plans. And among other things, these surveys assess student staff and parents to get school, climate, and cultural support and see possible barriers to take them down and to get the stakeholders engagement to help youth development and well-being to enhance the social climate. So with all this stuff that's coming in, for example, the pupil uh, engagement and parental involvement, some of the, again, the major goals I'm going to refer to again are English learners, interventions with individual students, and following the California state um, st uh, standards of alignment. So all of the, uh, these, three, these things above that I mentioned um, have a collection and reported to the school board for guidance of the allocation of funds. So that's got to come back to the school board. We get the opinions of not only the students, but also the parents and the other stakeholders in the district. And then it's up to the school board to take those things and implement them in the financial support for the district. Okay, thank you. Okay, Richard. I have the same answers that he has. <laughs> and uh, I believe the percentages, there's four for the administration and 85% for the classroom. And most of that information is uh, inputted by the community, parents, teachers, and principals and staff. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Galena, Hank. Thank you, Dick. You said my speech. I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the, uh, in, in dealing with question three, um, looking at the total budget uh, thing, 85%, uh, 86% of, of, of our school budget is uh, salaries and, and benefits. And approximately only 4% has to go to administration. And in doing some re uh, quick research and so forth, that is the lowest percentage in the, in the county of only 4% of our budget of, uh, goes to administration. Uh, there is the formula which, uh, which my colleague Dick mentioned as far as the, uh, the, the the budget formula and the money that's coming from the state, that is the formula, the LCAP uh, that was written uh, and took a couple of years. And uh, I hope I don't embarrass somebody, but the tremendous work that our assistant superintendent in curricular services to put that thing together, we got nothing but big could do's from the county there. And then from that, that is how you're going to use that money and then 
uh, the, and then that goes to the schools, and each school uh, puts together a school plan based upon the um, Oh, based upon the LCAP. That LCAP itself, it's gone through a lot of changes at the state, and our LCAP, very, very detailed, 112 pages. And uh, it's putting that thing together. Um, there is a, and the plan has been approved by the, uh, the county office and so forth, and it's, um, and everything's in place, and things to it. Um, so again, uh, it is a, it's a good thing because schools and a lot of parents, schools and so forth, all had contributions. I sit on the, uh, on the LCAP advisory committee, so I, I, so I knew what was going on, and I had a great deal of respect and so forth about everything putting put together. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Well, this is 2016 and school budgets have changed, believe me. Used to be, uh, the way it worked is the state would give this district money and the district would have to set so much aside, three to five percent, you ask yourself why. Well, if you don't keep the money in there, you have to, the state mandates a three percent reserve in case of a rainy day. All of a sudden, I remember a, lot, a couple years ago, gas went up like 18 or 20 cents really quick and where are you going to get that money for the school buses? You got to go to the reserve to pick it up. Or uh, you break uh, you break something big, a transformer goes out. You got to like what happened at Cabrillo High School. You got to replace a transformer. So that's one thing. Now with the LCAP, and I'm not I'm not going to embarrass her, but Kathy Froming did a heck of a job. In fact, she's been notified by the district, by the county, that that LCAP report that we've got here in Lompoc is one of the best ones written in the state. And in it, that is the roadmap that's used for all the schools to spend money and it used to be you had to give them the money went from the district to the sites and the district would keep more than they should I always thought as a site administrator I never had enough money and then I'd give it, uh, I'd give it to the staffs so here it is and I'd keep 25 percent out in case I broke a backboard or something I had to replace it and at the end of the year the only thing I don't like about budgets is you had to if you didn't spend it you lost it and I think that's a waste, because a lot of times you're just buying stuff, just to, you're gonna buy something because you're not gonna leave the money there. But if you could save it, so I uh, figure it's something to do there. But on the LCAP, that's, that's the roadmap to, uh, for uh, spending money. And it can only happen if you include the, the parents and stakeholders and the students of each school. And each school decides what they're gonna get, for example, we just hired $1.5 million, uh, $1 million worth of custodians a couple years ago, or last year, because they, they noticed the campuses are dirty. Before, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a, we need to pass the school bond people, because go look at Hapgood, they're hurting down there. They got one bathroom for the whole darn place. So it's, it's we got to do some stuff here, people. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, fourth question, and we'll start with Richard. What specific programs would you propose to enhance student achievement and to bolster academics and technical skills for all students? You are talking about curriculum, aren't you? I am. All right. Got the right answer. I would like to recommend to enhance all the reading programs. Because if you can't read, you won't be able to understand any other the subjects that you are going to get in the other upper grades. So reading is very important. In the pro programs that I'm familiar with, but I have not uh, first in it, is Alexa and Reading Plus. I'm getting this information because I used to volunteer at one of the local schools. I've been with them for five years. I did not do it this year because I have issues at home. I'm taken care of. So that's all I have to say. And the reading skills have to be improved. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then if you can pass that down to. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Uh, Molina. There's a question for regarding the curriculum and technology thing. Uh, right now, as I go around to the schools, the curriculum is full and there's uh, 
Uh, it's, it's full with a great deal of innovative programs that have happened in the last few years. Uh, we have dual immersion. Uh, we have the STEAM, science, technology, uh, engineering, art, and, and mathematics. And I just got involved with a, a tremendous math program called Number Talks, the graphic design at Cabrillo High Schools, the coding, uh, second graders doing coding in, in technology, um, and robotics uh, going on, and also the um, visual and performing arts at Los Barros School. And so the, the curriculum is pretty well full. My thing, is, and technology, there's 6,500 computers in this district. Not That's not count what's at the district office. Uh, like, for instance, Lompoc Valley Middle School, every student has a laptop and thing. And so the technology is moving uh, in, in a good way. The, mo the movement is not what to teach. It's not what to teach. And my suggestion and thing is, not what to teach, but how to teach. And I'm looking at three items. One has to do with relationships first. That's the very first one, the relationship between the students and the teachers and so forth. The American, the Association of Supervision and Curriculum Development, the largest curriculum organization in the country, their September thing, relationships first. 21st century skills to work on and also learning styles uh, to, to, to work with that. And uh, so it's not what we teach, it's how we teach, I believe, is the, our, our next big movement. And it's going in that direction. OK, thank you. OK, you can pass it to Jeff. If you haven't had an opportunity to get out to the local elementary schools, you're missing your boat. Because number one, Education starts at home. The parent is the primary educator of the kids, and they got to start at an early age. When they get to school, and if they start being absent, then they start falling behind, and you have a, then they get to start acting out. So you see where that goes. Now, what I what I like to see is what I've seen is happening. There's new programs in the district. The Visual and Performing Arts at Los Barros is doing a fantastic job. I went over there for open house, and those kids are so excited. I can't believe it. Everybody's there. I mean, it's, the kids are having pride in the school. So learning's happening. They don't want to miss school. They want to be there every day. I went to uh, uh, Hapgood, and I saw Carmen. She took me to dual immersion. She showed me two first graders, primary English language learners, or two uh, English language people that didn't have a word of Spanish, now fluid almost after this six weeks in the school year, with the right accent and everything. Then I go up to the STEAM Academy here at La Honda, and Bree's got those kids moving. It's uh, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. I mean, my gosh, these are kids that are all pumped up. They're ready to go. Maple High School. I've never seen a continuation. Those kids are out working in the community. They're, they're providing out services. In fact, they do coaching in the afternoon. They come to the elementary schools, and they coach the little kids. That's similar to what we did, used to do at uh, La Prisma. We had the eighth graders, big brother, big sister with the uh, first graders and stuff like that. So it's happening and we have a continual flow with English and math so far. I think they're doing English uh, adoption this year for books. So if you haven't had a chance to see what's going on, please get out and look at it because you'll be surprised. And everything that's coming from these schools is all staff driven. If it comes from downtown, I can tell you as an ex-principal, it's hard to sell it to the staff. But when it comes to the staff up and they're involved, they're going to bust their butt to try to make it work. And they do, and that's why it's successful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dick. A little bit of a review here. And you, you want us to enhance student achievement um, and the technical skills and all that. And that's already been mentioned by these gentlemen. But uh, again, I was able to visit with eight, um, eight schools and eight principals. I'm, I'm still working at it. I'm going to see Fillmore Friday. It's hard to get out there. and. These principals have been just wonderful in showing us around. And I want to echo the uh, comments of the, the gentleman before me. Um, the, the STEAM Academy itself, I'll just throw one thing at you. In one of the classrooms, they have like a standing uh, station, a couple of standing stations where the kids actually stand at high tables and work. And there's a little uh, stool behind them, and they can just sit down a little bit. And just that day in the paper, there was um, uh, three schools in uh, elementary schools in Texas that over a two-year program they compared the regular students in sitting desks and standing desks 
and the BMI uh, index, the body mass index, each year went down 5% for those in the standing desks. So Bree was kind of ecstatic, like this is a cutting edge thing. It's a little different that's going on. Um, and all the other things he's talking about, they were talking about on that, the dual immersion program at Hapgood, the, the great things that are going on there. Um, and again, what Jeff mentioned was the whole wing on A Street has one little bathroom for the boys. So measure in for people who are against this bond, you know, if they think it took care of everything, it did not, okay? They never got things finished. So that's just a point we'll talk about later too. Uh, the Visual and Performing Arts Academy at Los Barros, the, ex the expansive uh, viticulture and horticulture program up at Cabrillo, which is amazing, and obviously the aquarium there. The STAR programs, the uh, Future Business Leaders America, FFA, ROP Auto, uh, their Lompoc High School, and the student training program, where Tom Blanco has been there over 30 years uh, working with kids and, and, and working with uh, the student trainers, where they actually do the taping and working, and he's placed so many kids on the college level that are now professionals out in the field. And then also there's um, a matching grant through Raytheon at Buena Vista High School, which is kind of a cool thing to do. And then there's makerspace stuff going on as far as taking existing facilities and turning it into technology, computers, uh, skills, and robotics. And that's being done. They're trying to do it at LVMS and at VM and VMS. Principals are working together, taking a room to do that. So there's some really cool things going on. But we need to support all these programs and think of some new ones and support the music, drama, and athletics also. Okay, thank you. Could you could? <laughs> We're not going to start something here, are we? No. No. Okay. 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 I'm older than he is. <laughs> uh, one thing I forgot to mention is what's going on at the junior highs. They have an AVID program, man. I would, used to be a principal in the Orcutt district, and they're very big in AVID. AVID is Advancement via Individual Determination. What I see is those kids are learning the Cornell note taking and higher level skills that prepares them for college or high school so they can take notes in high school. Then what we have in high school is they have a dual enrollment program at Allen Hancock College. We have about 80 or 90 freshmen, or actually 340 freshmen according to Cabrillo, are in a dual enrollment where those kids are getting high school credit and junior college credit at the same time. If that's not top cutting edge, I don't know what is. So thank you very much. Sorry I missed that. Okay, thank you. All right. Now, I'm going to turn this back on so it'll shine in your eyes just a little bit. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Sorry, we're not there yet. Okay, here's a surprise question. It's easy, don't worry. In your campaigning so far, what is the most pressing and major concern of teachers and or students that you have discovered? How would you propose to address it? And we're going to start with number one, Mr. Galena. Oh, is this okay. And going around to the schools and so forth and the campaigning and also with the community, uh, the biggest thing that I'm, I'm hearing has to deal with the whole concept of time and to get things uh, moving in the, in the classrooms and things. And so it has to be setting up the priorities as to uh, the, how, how to use the time. That seems to be one of the biggest uh, things that I have seen in, in, in looking around with that. And as I mentioned under the curriculum, our curriculum is full right now. And there's a lot of things going on and things. And we just need to uh, take it easy is take it easy and to continue to uh, it, uh, improve on what we're doing uh, as far as the curriculum and as far as the building of relationships, what I think. And um, as I say, that's about the only thing. Been going around, I have not seen, I've been in this district for 50 years, and I have not seen since the early 60s and the 70s more smiles on teachers' faces than I have seen in the last four years. Something is going on. We're back to the glory. We're going back to the glory days of the 60s and the 70s. And so, the what? <laughs> no, I'm just saying that the fact that we are, that the morale of the district is going right up there and uh, 
the challenges that we do have, we still have challenges uh, that goes on there, but as far as serious problems, uh, as far as challenges and so forth, no. We still need to keep working and working in development the relationship between the teachers and the students, the teachers and the teachers, the principal and the, uh, and, and the teachers and the principal and the schools and the community. The big thing as far as it has to do with build, continue to build that positive relationship. This district is in great shape. In the last four years, we have come a long way. And I think as I say, just seeing the smiles on the teachers' faces when you go into those classrooms, something is going on. Okay, thank you, and you can pass it to Jeff. I like uh, Hank, have been around talking to kids, seeing all the good teachers that we see now. I see ex-teachers that I had at La Prisma now teaching in the district. They're good ones. I know I can speak for them, and they're all happier in Larks. I had never seen such a happy group of teachers. I go, is this the right school district? Because when I left about 10 years ago, it wasn't that way. One of the things that I'm really disappointed in is this community is the amount of coverage we're getting in a newspaper. That's what I've been hearing around. And how disappointed people are, we're making a first page above the fold on almost everything that's happening. And I don't think that's fair. I don't think they, they, the papers have spent enough time working on the positive things that are happening in the district. For example, this morning, I didn't know we had a uh, California Highway Patrol in Lompoc. And the Lompoc, in the Santa Barbara Press, said Lompoc CHP. Uh, we don't have a CHP, as far as I know, in California. And that's just one issue. And then they had a they had this situation with the, the coach on front page. I mean, normally if there's another area, it's on the back page. So, I mean, those types of things, we've got to do a better job of making sure the positives are getting out there. And I think, we, even if we have to write our own articles, darn, I'm not going to start writing them and send them to the county. But I think that's one of the things, and I, people like around there, they're disappointed too. Hey, Jeff, what can you do about this press? Well, we can just, just try to make sure we keep our best foot forward and let everybody know what we're doing and what we're all about. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dick. Follow Jeff's uh, comment, Snoopy used to say, uh, good news should be shouted from the rooftops. And uh, as he said, a lot of times it's hard to get that good news out of there. But again, I also recommend that you get out to the campuses, even go to school board meetings too, because uh, a lot of the young principals out there have really received help from our staff at the district office. I can't say much about it. Their first year or two, they're asking questions. Am I doing this right? Is this legal? And how do I do this? And uh, all of them were telling me how, how great when they talked to the staff at the district office, how they were supported. I'll tell you some things, the biggest things that I saw, and I've got two grandkids in Buena Vista, and my both daughters graduated from LVMS in Lompo Kai. Um, and that is just the, the the condition of our schools, ladies and gentlemen, is atrocious. It's ridiculous. Get out there and look at it. These schools are built in the 50s and 60s. You go there on a 100 degree day at Hapgood, the windows don't even work. They got a door, they got no air conditioning, and yet you go inside, happy kids, great teachers. It's amazing all the great things that are happening considering the deterioration. And that's why this Measure L thing is important. Now, if we could do with bake sales and barbecues, that'd be nice, but I don't think we're going to raise 65 million. And I have friends that uh, are opposed to it. And if they are, that's fine. If it doesn't pass, if I get on, we'll do whatever we can to try to find the money. And I'll try to do the best I can. But um, just the principles, windows, for example, and then the blinds. An active shooter can see through the blinds. The blinds don't even work in a lot of the schools. Little things like that. Uh, we read, mentioned the bathroom. Uh, three outlets in a big uh, technological program like the STEAM Academy. Three outlets. They need more than that if we're going to go ahead and do all the technology we want to do. The playing fields for athletics and, and the PE kids, atrocious, dangerous. Okay, I'm coaching out there. Kids are spraining their ankles just running around, and it's just ridiculous. And we need to find the money to help do that, okay? Um, and also at Hapgood. Hapgood, they've got a nurse there two or three days a week. The other two days, the staff has to go and help be a nurse and take away from their jobs. So there's, there's a lot of different things that need to help to be done, and I'll mention some of that in my concluding statements. Okay, thank you. Richard. I'm gonna follow up with the, um, Mr. Barrett there. I visited all the schools in 2014. They have the same issues they have now. I went to Crestview with Mr. Dr. Falk, and he took me around he said, my blinds are messed up. 
We haven't had to get any new blinds. Those same blinds are still not fixed now. I went to Cabrillo. They have sidewalks that are cracked. They need to be fixed. There's a safety hazard. There's a school in our district that doesn't have windows for one classroom. That should be fixed. Maintenance is my, one of my big issues, and safety. And it's not being done what I can see. I know one year at a school that I, at the school I volunteered for, a teacher was locked out of her room. It took them a pretty good time to get there to get it fixed. They got in. That should not happen at all. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for answering all the questions so well. And now we can applaud. <laughs> So this is a question uh, asked to Mr. Galena, and then everybody gets a chance to answer this, remember? Okay. What is your opinion of Common Core curriculum, the testing, and child history teaching? Tracking, tracking, sorry, tracking. Okay, what is your opinion of Common Core curriculum, the testing, and child history tracking? And you have one minute. One minute, oh, oh come on, man. <laughs> well, otherwise we won't give many questions. Uh, the common, okay, one minute, yeah. Uh, uh, wow, that was, that's an old, whoa. <laughs> well, Where do we start? Yes. The Common Core, uh, we've had Common Core, good teachers, good schools have been doing Common Core since day one. So there's nothing to this. My thing is with this high stake testing, High stake testing, high stake testing, the, the whole thing that goes on there, I think we need, that needs to be backed off. And that's coming not only from my point of view, but as you read about this across, across the country and so forth, and uh, with educators and parents and so forth, the high stake testing is something's got to be done about that. I'm sorry. I think. But the common core and the critical thinking and so forth, that's been going on. and I. 110% approve of that. And the last part of that question was? About the tracking. The, the mm -hmm. Child history tracking. I'm not familiar with that, I'm sorry. Uh, child, it's, it's a new thing with me of child history tracking. Uh, I just don't know what that's all about, I'm sorry. Okay. <coughs> Uh, okay. I, think, I think by tracking you mean just following kids around so you, you put the good kids in one class, you track the higher level of achievement students and the lower level of achievement students? Wow. I think that I think the state's got to stay out of the bedroom. But anyway, uh, I kind of agree with Hank a little bit that the Common Core, I think, is there's many ways to teach it. And that's why you've seen all these young academies. That's why you've seen a Vocational Arts Academy at Los Barros. And you've seen a different program at different schools. Are, they're doing something different to attract those kids, get a hook in them. And once you get a hook in them, boy, they're, they're just like Byrona. They go after it. As long as you get the kids hooked, it doesn't matter what you're doing. They're going to go after it. So. I think I really, I really appreciate, and I tell you what, this district's in good shape. I really believe that. But that's that's my feeling about Common Core. Okay, thank you, Dick. Obviously, the Common Core has been backed by our school district, and um, everybody's been buying into it, and with great success. I will say, there's an old guy up here. When I first started teaching in 1970, it was behavioral objectives, and then it's something else and something else. Whoever the state superintendent of public instruction is, now we're going to reinvent the wheel. Okay, so I just want to make that comment because we have to be careful about the next great thing coming up. But Common Core seems to be working with us, and I know it's backed by our school board and our superintendent. As far as the tracking, yeah, yeah, what the heck's the state doing that for? I mean, they. It's a situation where, obviously, student history, if needed, you know, that, that's one thing. But as far as trying to go back so far in time, um, you know, they, they, the, the schools have, the colleges have enough to worry about without going clear back in time. Okay. Thank you. Richard. Um, the Common Core, I agree with the way they are being uh, instructed in the school. And I think I see there's a lot of improvement in some of the students that I've been associated with for the last five years. 
Uh, on the tracking, I believe, I discussed this with one of the teachers at one of my schools, uh, at the school I used to volunteer at, and I believe is where they take a student by their number and track them all the way up through the end of this, their uh, term, all the way up there to the college level once they get out of high school. That's my th way of thinking. That's all I know. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. This question is for Jeff. Uh, the teacher shortage is an issue that our district has to pay more attention to, especially minority and qualified Spanish-speaking teachers for the dual immersion program. How can our district become more competitive so it attracts the best? Well, two things. Number one, if you keep getting first-year teachers, sometimes you get a, you're starting over every year. I think that's important. The reason you do that is to keep the salaries down, and that way, hopefully, you get them young and they're starting to grow. But I, I really think that I've, I've noticed some changes. I've noticed we're getting we're attracting students from uh, Santa Barbara, and we haven't done that before because the salaries here have improved quite a bit since I left. And when you do that, then you're going to start getting better people. You're going to get more qualified people, and now you got to get a B cloud credential and stuff like that, even to get fully credentialed. So these there's requirements uh, that teachers have to meet to get their full credential now. So I think that'll help. As a high school principal, I always looked at what I could do outside the classroom as well. I really believe it's important to hook those kids, and I think it's important for teachers to see the students and something doing something outside the classroom. So I know they're having some coaching problems. Uh, you keep getting first-year coaches, you're going to have some problems. So I see the stop sign, so uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Dick. I've always been afraid of morale anyway. It shows that stop sign up and makes it worse, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, as, as far as all that is concerned, um, the hiring, I think, we need to recruit. I mean, we need to get out there. I mean, we've got a lot to hang our, 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 our hats on, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, come on, with California Distinguished School, three in the whole county and two of them right here? I mean, that should be just all over, everywhere, okay? And that should be a recruiting tool to get people to come to Lompo because they're good schools. And, and that's, that's, those are facts, okay? But um, I don't know. You know, I, I don't want to get into the politics and, and how we're told that we're not the best community. We've, you know, what Mr. Carvajal said was just something that's been an ongoing attitude from down south since I've been to town 30 years ago. But it's a great place here, and we have to convince people that it is. I think once people that are aware of that and see the statistics and how well we are doing, then we're going to be more successful in the hiring. We just have to be a little bit more, um, get out there and recruit. Okay, Richard, thank you. I would like to say that the teachers are doing their job. They're teaching the children or students what they're supposed to do. But the children are not learning. I see this when I was volunteering. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, we'll come back to Mr. Galena. We're going through a transformation here in Lompoc. Um, I am on the uh, the Tri-County Coalition that we meet once a month. And we are, with our president and superintendent, we are inundated by superintendents and principals and school board members when we go to that meeting. What is going on in Lompoc? What is going on in a very positive, very positive way? And to look at our teachers and what I'm hearing and why we hired 69 new, I think it's about 69 new teachers we've hired. And the big thing that I'm in talking with them is the ability to be creative in their teaching. And there isn't one way, because what I'm hearing is a lot of the school districts, and I, as a Cal Poly as supervisor of student teachers, I've worked with schools from Carpinteria to Arroyo Grande. And the thing, big thing is that there's only one way of teaching in this school, and that's the way it is. Lompoc is getting away from that, and the word is getting out around in the community, in the in the profession, and Lompoc is the place to become, where you can be creative, and you will get the support from the administrative staff, both at the local level and at the school level. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question is for Mr. Barrett. So, if you want to pass that to him, Dick. 
Okay. What are the effects of Proposition 51 and Measure L, 2016, on each other? Are there matching funds or not on these K through 12 and community colleges? How much and how are they determined? Part of that I don't know the answer to. I wish someone would tell me. But I can talk about Measure L, and, and you know, we've, we've kind of got the word out, the district's got the word out on that. And again, you know, there's people that say, well, you know, I don't want to have to go through another Measure N and all this stuff, and I don't want to, I want my taxes to go down and things like that. But I think, you know, Lompoc is a special place. It takes a village to raise a child, and I think Lompoc is a tremendous village. Uh, we've been able to do things as a community here that no other community around us has been able to do. For example, really for life, we raise more money than Santa Barbara and Santa Maria. That's never in the headlines, but we do. And how is that possible? Just in a little old lump book, it's because people believe in doing those kinds of things and those good works. And I think the same thing applies to our schools. It may pass, it may not pass. I mean, if it doesn't pass, then we're going to have to roll up our sleeves and figure out another way. But I, I don't know that much about the 51. Um, I'm trying to read the, bond, the, 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 uh, the different bond things like you in that thick book. I'm trying to figure it out, and honestly, you know, who do you, who do you, what do I, what do I? Okay, but I can't, I can't address the bond, and I, I think that it's something I'm going to support because of the fact that um, we need the money to get it done, and, and hopefully this community will make the sacrifices for our children to make our school district great and keep it great. Okay, thank you. Richard. I believe the split is 60-40 for the school bond, um, if I can remember well. But other than that, I, I agree with Mr. Barrett about supporting the bond, because we need it in the district. And if people vote on it, fine. If they don't, that's their choice. That's all about it. Go out there and vote. Thank you. OK, and then pass it down for Mr. Galena. Starting off, the, the, uh, I am very, very much in favor of, uh, uh, of the bond issue. Um, there, were three, there were three teachers. There were three kinds of teachers. One is the teacher at home, the parents. The second is the classroom teacher. And the third teacher is the environment within the school, within the classroom itself. Those are the three environments for education. And when you go into some of these schools, as I say, I've been here since 60, 62, and, uh, and seeing the condition of these schools, uh, they need, and God bless the teachers, the way they have decorated their rooms and covered up a lot of the cracks in the walls and everything else. Bless their hearts and stuff. You know, they, they wonder, why are they putting up a poster on there? That, yeah, if you go and look and see what's there. And, the, um, and there is no tax increase, and uh, what, with the bond issue and so forth. Okay, thank you. And Jeff, Jeff has to answer. Everybody gets to answer. Well, I understand. Uh, matching funds from the state means there's a percentage of funds. I think there's eight or ten million dollars available. If we pass the bond here, that we get matching funds from the state at about that amount. So instead of just paying, passing sixty-seven, it goes up eight or ten million dollars. So what's that? Almost seventy-seven million dollars. You can do a lot with ten million dollars. And that's what they mean by matching funds. And, but unfortunately, since the school board, I hate to point fingers, but the school board voted three to two, that means this district's got to get 67%. And that's awful hard to do, I really think. What's the other question? Uh, about matching K through 12 community colleges affects the Proposition 51 and Measure L on each other. Well, as you, as you know, I think Dick and I both are sharing the same uh, point here that we need to fix the schools. We need to, you know, I'm, I'm all for curb appeal. I was told a long time ago, 80% of the people in the community do not have anything to do with the school. So they drive by it and they look at it and it's all shabby, run down, and looks like dirt. And they say, oh boy, those guys aren't doing a very good job. So then they're going to less likely to pass a school bond. If you can keep the schools neat and tidy and make the school curb appeal look good, and I think we're halfway there. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. And then we'll start with Mr. King for this question. And this is kind of a long one, so, okay. 
Many teachers believe that many of the issues in the classroom, behavioral issues, literacy issues, and so forth, can be addressed with small class sizes. At the high school, it is not uncommon for classes to number between 35 and 40 students. How important is reducing class sizes to you, and how would you go about making this a reality? Um, that's a hard one to answer. Um, I really can't answer that. I, don't, I really couldn't come up with an answer to that, both of those right now. Okay. I could on uh, one, but I'm not going to expand on that. Okay. okay. It's Hank's turn. He said 30 seconds to think about it. Uh, the interesting que uh, qu question, yeah, it was quite long. I, I come from a position in terms of education, um, and some, and most of you people who know me, I come from a position of relationships. And if there's the relationship built between the student and the teacher, yes, sometimes you get into 30 and 40 and so forth, but if that's that positive relationship, there, that takes care of a lot of the behavioral problems. And this is what I've been getting in teaching the graduate level classes for Cambridge College and student and, and listening to these teachers. And it just, it thing. now, there is a thing if you can say when you reduce the class sizes, that means uh, more teachers and that means a, a, a budget situation. Uh, that means a budget situation. But I am very, very strong in feeling of building the relationship between. And if I just can tell you a quick little story about what happened. I'm, I have a quick little story what happened. I had an, I had an art teacher um, in one of my classes, and she was having a problem with behavior in there. And she asked me, and I says, you know one thing you can do with that, Glennette? Meet your, meet your students. This is a high school, Paris High School. Meet your students at the door when they come in and say, hi, how do you do? What kind of a weekend do you have? What do you think? And she did that, and she said, in two days, her behavior problems went away. Good. That's okay. Okay. Jeff. Do you want, do you remember all of that? Uh, pretty much. Okay. <laughs> Basically, what I'm seeing is uh, when you hire first-year teachers, they don't have their discipline bag yet together, the bag of tricks. And oftentimes they get stuck with lower classes. And they, for, for high school level, you see them in teaching freshman classes, and a discipline becomes more of a discipline problem than a learning problem, because she's trying to control the turkeys that are getting out of the hand. But now there's a new uh, there's a new formula that allows money to be for class size reduction. That it used to be all on one budget. Now they have specific budget areas to cover it. For example, class size reduction for K-12 or K-3 is $723 extra from the state per student. That we can keep your class sizes down a little bit. Then there's uh, technology education for high schools is $219 extra a student. So we get $6,952 of K-3, $7,056 of 4-6, and $84.19 for high school. That's not bad. But the other thing is what you got to remember, if you have, if you want AP classes, advanced prep or advanced placement, sometimes you only need 15, you only get 15 students in there. Well, what's going to happen if there's, if you're staffed at 30 to 1, where you got to put those other 15 students somewhere, don't you? So the high school has got to understand that some of the classes are going to be bigger. Nor normally they don't give them to the rookie teachers, but we try to give them to the more uh, kids, guys that can handle discipline, so. And gals. And gals. Okay. People. Right. right. You can pass it to Dick, right? <laughs> uh, you've been given the, uh, the stats, I guess, but I, I will say as, a, as an English teacher and a reading improvement teacher for, for years and years, I, I mean, I did, my, uh, I did my senior project in college on, on the, uh, my master's thesis at San Jose State in, in student-teacher ratios and compare different classes, it's a no-brainer, okay? It's really a no-brainer. I've done it at Lompoc High, I've done it at Truckee High, I've done it at James Lick High in San Jose. 
The problem you have, again, is staffing money-wise. If you're going to get those, you get your 12 kids, you got them. You know, I was working in a special academy at Lompoc Kai. We got those kids. They were kids with D's and F's from the middle school, but they had intelligence, you know. And so a lot of them, we had a great graduation rate with those kids once we got them that freshman year. But it's the only way to fly if you want to ensure success, especially in the reading and English fields, where you're going to get kids with a, with a, with a student-teacher ratio, the lower it is, then the higher the reading level increases are going to be. I will say that. I'll call myself an expert. I'm sorry. Okay, but I've been through that years and years and years. So I will. I did want to address that point. That's a good point. But again, financing it is the question. Okay. Thank you. Now, Mr. King, would you like to make any comments? No. no? Okay. 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 We have uh, one last question, unless you've come up with another one. Uh, and we'll start with Mr. Galena with this one. What is your position regarding communicating with individual teachers? Do you welcome questions and concerns from them? Are you sure that's a question? <laughs> well, it's right here. Must be. That's, that's a real easy one, I okay. mean. Well, you should get an easy <laughs> one. The whole it's thing okay. about communication and relationship is something that I feel very, very strong about. I noticed that. And to be open and so forth. And something that just came to me in the last six months, something called social constructivism. And that means to listening to teachers and, or to uh, parents and so forth because they come from a different kinds of experiences and things. And we, the human species, have to be right. But with constructivism, and we listen to people who have uh, different opinions and so forth, we can learn from them of people coming from a different way. So absolutely. <laughs> Okay. That's an easy one. Okay. <laughs> okay, pass it to Jeff. Jeff we can talk to you all you want, but you're not going to make any choices. There's a protocol that's established, it's got to be established, for taking problems. If it comes to the school board, the school board is just going to sit on it. They're going to hopefully direct that person if there's a problem at school, issue at school, they go to the, they try to always handle it at the lowest level. If a teacher, if a parent calls up and has got a problem with a teacher, have the teacher meet with the kid and a parent. And then, uh, then if that doesn't work, then it's a principal, parent, and kid. Then it just goes up the ladder. The last one to get it is a superintendent. And we, we, we're to set policy. We don't do anything. We're just going to set policy as, a, as a board members. That's what we should be doing, governance. If there's not a policy to make it, to handle each situation, then you got you got you to develop some policy. But there's got to be a protocol for handling complaints. OK, thank you. Dick. As a school board member, I'd welcome any teacher parent conversations you know again my role is a specified role as a school board member however I want to know I want to learn I mean before I went to those eight schools in the last couple of months I mean I had no idea the things that I was talking to you about earlier tonight and I think we can all be educated you know as a coach dealing with many different parents um, I still want to know you know I, I want to know what makes that family tick what can I do to support that family I want to know what I can do to support that teacher. Maybe not as a school board member, maybe I can make some calls to people I know within the district. You know, maybe I can offer them some kind of advice from my, all the years I've had. Maybe not, but I would certainly try. But I would welcome, even as a school board member, any communication from anybody, any time. Okay, thank you. Richard. I understand protocol, and that's the way it should be done. When the person asks you a question, you direct it to the right person. That right person who should either be the teacher, principal, and sequence. And the last person should be the superintendent of the school. Thank you. OK, thank you. Any more questions? OK. Now we're going to, do you have another question? All right. OK, and so we'll start with Mr. Barrett on this one. $65 million bond has a budget been prepared for the use of the funds with estimates obtained from contractors as needed. Will solar be included in the improvements? That's a really good question. Um, if you guys got the handouts or have done any reading on it, they have really specified what it can be used for. The things it can't be used for are or for classroom teachers' salaries and that sort of thing. But there's, you know, the budget itself is is to set up as an estimate uh, coming through our facility people and maintenance people to the superintendent. 
okay, to the best, you know, and it's an approximation, obviously, but one thing, the way it's gonna be worked out is by the oversight committee. There will be an oversight committee made up of four people who are not even associated with the school district. They will be citizens, they'll be seniors, they'll be people who um, maybe are active in the PTA and just private citizens, and those four people are gonna really have the biggest brunt as far as where that money is going to go. So if you, you gotta really look at the specifics. It, we've been talking about some of the things it can go to, okay? But uh, you know, it, it, it's hard to break it down individually, you know, because this is the information we're being given. But as far as who breaks it down, it's gonna be the citizens of Lompoc who were chosen to be on that committee to make those decisions. Okay, Richard, do you have any comments on this? I agree with the uh, with Mr. Barrett about the oversight where the funds go to. Um, I like to see the uh, solar go into the district because that uh, bring down some of the budget that we have to deal with, especially with the electricity. We use tons of electricity here in the, in the Lompoc Unified School District. As I said, I, I agree with the, uh, the policy about the people choosing where the funds go to. Thank you. Okay, Hank. I don't think that it's where that money is going to be spent, but the money has to be, uh, there has to be something from the district that will be very specific as where that funding is going to go to. And since it has to deal with, as Dick said, it has to go through facilities and no salaries or um, things, but it has to be for the improvement of facilities. And we're waiting uh, for these specifics from our um, maintenance and operation uh, department to come to be specific. Is solar a part of it? I don't know. It could be, uh, it, it could be. And the oversight committee, of course, is you better spend the money the way you said you're going to spend it. That's the purpose of the, the oversight committee. So it's a very strict and it's very accountable as to how that money will be spent and, and thing. But we have to have it very detailed so that the community knows what it's all about. Okay. And Jeff? How's the ball in measure L or N? I forget the last one we did in 2003 when we passed that bond. And what had happened is we didn't get the matching funds for the state because the district didn't do their due diligence to get the, get the application on time. I don't know if you guys remember back then. So it's going to take a whole lot more to get them ready now because as a community, I think we let them down a little bit. Now, I know these people were involved in it at that time, so they're all gone. But aren't we, we missed an opportunity to get matching funds last time because we didn't have our application in the state in time. So they said, sorry, money's gone. So, but I agree that uh, we have such good programs and... If you don't get it now, it's not going to get any cheaper, believe me. So if we got to pass the bond, I mean, we need everybody's help. And if people don't believe me, you need to go to some of these schools that have been here for a while and take a look at yourself and take a look and, and you're going to be disgusted as, as we are with the lack of facilities that we have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions, uh, but we did touch on a lot of subjects, so that's good. And now we're ready for our closing statements, which are one minute. And we're going to start with Richard. It's very important for this school district. It's very important for this school district to and the people of the uh, district uh, to support the district. So we need that support as far as the district is concerned. And if we don't have that support, we won't have a good school district, if that's understandable. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Galena. One of the uh, things on my brochure it says re-elect Henry Galena, and the comment is that's what it's all about. This is the thing as far as students are concerned. But to be able to do this, what it's all about, and to meet these needs, we need to take care of 
1,500 employees, adult employees in the district. I'm talking about classified, certificated, and administration. They need to have absolute support so that this is what it's all about to take care of with these students. The other thing is that we have to understand that we're on a journey. What the destination is, I don't know. Think our world is changing and what's this world going to look like in five years? But we have to keep the journey and the journey is to continue to find the very best ways to take care of our students and the very, very best ways to take care of our 1,500 employees it's going so that we can meet wherever the the destination is. It's a long way, and we don't know what's going to happen, but if we keep up the spirit and so forth. Okay, thank you. And you can pass it to Jeff. Thank you. I'm running for the school board because I believe we have a, you know, we have to do a better job of working with our students to provide an education for the 21st century. I've been in the Lompoc area for 12 of the past 16 years and have served this community as a high school principal and as an elementary school principal. During my 43 and a half years in education, I've been a parent, teacher, and coach, and I know the challenges schools face and what it takes to create, build, and sustain successful programs. I truly believe that Lompoc is on the right track. Throughout my career, I have built strong relationships and brought people together to get things done. It's time to take an honest look at what is working and develop so we can develop successful strategies, hire the right people, and continue to work and create and promote exciting new programs like the STEAM at La Honda, like they have at La Costa, at La, La Cañada, visual performing arts at Los Barros, and the dual immersion at Hapgood. That's a great start. And, and for, I feel a better, I feel a board member's primary responsibility is to set policy. I really do. And I think that I know this, how special the Lompoc area is. I would like a chance to be a board member here, do a good job for you, and I ask your vote. And remember, vote early and vote often. <laughs> <laughs> OK. As I said before, we got great schools. You ought to be proud of our teachers and our kids and the progress they're making and our administrators and all of the above. Um, I really want to improve the school board meeting atmosphere. I mean, we have to be civil people. We can't have hostility towards one another or personal issues against one another. It's supposed to be about the kids and our school district and all these issues we've been talking about tonight. But unfortunately, you can't get past that other stuff if you go to a school board meeting. So hopefully with my, uh, my passion and my you know, my energy in, positive, in a positive way, I can help with that. Um, also, some things we can do to help improve some things, maybe a little more grant writing. We get some experts in there to help us get some money other ways, like through grant writing. Volunteerism. I mean, you can't even work sometimes with, with grounds people and other people because of the laws of you're taking work away from them. Well, how about some volunteers in the community, like contractors that are willing to help out the school district working side by side with our school district people to provide things that we can get done. Okay, I know Vandenberg Air Force Base has been tapped, but it would be great to keep them involved in helping us all. If you'd like to know more information about me and my background, it's on the back table. Thanks for this opportunity. Okay, and now we've heard from everybody, so let's give them a big... <laughs> So we all want to thank you for running, because that's not always easy, but we want to thank you for that. And thank all of you for coming tonight. So hope you had a good time. Good night. Please take brochures in the back there.